2. Zionism from the standpoint of its victims. 1. Zionism and the attitudes of European colonialism. Every idea or system of ideas exists somewhere, is mixed in with historical circumstances, is part of what one may very simply call reality. One of the enduring attributes of self-serving idealism, however, is the notion that ideas are just ideas, and that they exist only in the realm of ideas. The tendency to view ideas as pertaining only to a world of abstractions increases among people for whom an idea is essentially perfect, good, uncontaminated by human desire or will. Such a view also applies when the ideas are considered to be evil, absolutely perfect in their evil, and so forth. When an idea has become effective, that is, when its value has been proved in reality by its widespread acceptance, some revision of it will of course seem to be necessary, since the idea must be viewed as having taken on some of the characteristics of brute reality. Thus it is frequently argued that such an idea as Zionism, for all its political tribulations and the struggles on its behalf, is at bottom an unchanging idea that expresses the yearning for Jewish political and religious self-determination, for Jewish national selfhood, to be exercised on the promised land. Because Zionism seems to have culminated in the creation of the State of Israel, it is also argued that the historical realization of the idea confirms its unchanging essence and, no less important, the means used for its realization. Very little is said about what Zionism entailed for non-Jews who happen to have encountered it, for that matter, nothing is said about where, outside Jewish history, it took place, and from what in the historical context of 19th century Europe Zionism drew its force to the Palestinian, for whom Zionism was somebody else's idea imported into Palestine and for which in a very concrete way he or she was made to pay and suffer, these forgotten things about Zionism are the very things that are centrally important. In short, effective political ideas like Zionism need to be examined historically in two ways, one, genealogically in order that their provenance, their kinship and descent, their affiliation both with other ideas and with political institutions may be demonstrated, two, as practical systems for accumulation, of power, land, ideological legitimacy, and displacement, of people, other ideas, prior legitimacy. Present political and cultural actualities make such an examination extraordinarily difficult, as much because Zionism in the post-industrial West has acquired for itself an almost unchallenged hegemony in liberal establishment discourse, as because in keeping with one of its central ideological characteristics, Zionism has hidden, or caused to disappear, the literal historical ground of its growth, its political cost to the native inhabitants of Palestine, and its militantly oppressive. Discriminations between Jews and non-Jews Consider as a startling instance of what I mean, the symbolism of Munnikin Begin, a former head of the Ergen Terror Organization, in whose past there are numerous, and frequently admitted, acts of cold-blooded murder, being honored as Israeli premier at Northwestern University in May 1978 with a doctorate of laws honoris causa a leader whose army a scant month before had created 300,000 new refugees in South Lebanon, who spoke constantly of Judea and Samaria as rightful parts of the Jewish state, claims made on the basis of the Old Testament and without so much as a reference to the land's actual inhabitants, and all this without, on the part of the press or the intellectual community, one sign of comprehension that Munich and Begin's honored position came about literally at the expense of Palestinian Arab silence in the Western marketplace of ideas that the entire historical duration of a Jewish state in Palestine prior to 1948 was a 60-year period two millennia ago, that the dispersion of the Palestinians was not a fact of nature but a result of specific force and strategies. The concealment by Zionism of its own history has by now therefore become institutionalized, and not only in Israel. To bring out its history as in a sense it was exacted from Palestine and the Palestinians, these victims on whose suppression Zionism and Israel have depended, is thus a specific intellectual political task in the present context of discussion about a comprehensive peace in the Middle East. The special, one might even call it the privileged, place in this discussion of the United States is impressive, for all sorts of reasons. 
In no other country, except Israel, is Zionism enshrined as an unquestioned good, and in no other country is there so strong a conjuncture of powerful institutions and interests, the press, the liberal intelligentsia, the military-industrial complex, the academic community, labor unions, for whom, as I said in Chapter 1, uncritical support of Israel and Zionism enhances their domestic as well as international standing. Although there has recently been some modulation in this remarkable consensus, due to the influence of Arab oil, the emergence of countervailing conservative states allied to the United States, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the redoubtable political and military visibility of the Palestinian people and their representatives, the PLO, the prevailing pro-Israeli bias persists. For not only does it have deep cultural roots in the West generally and the United States in particular, but its negative, interdictory character vis-a-vis -vis the whole historical reality is systematic. Yet there is no getting around the formidable historical reality that in trying to deal with what Zionism has suppressed about the Palestinian people, one also abuts the entire disastrous problem of anti-Semitism on the one hand, and on the other, the complex interrelationship between the Palestinians and the Arab states. Anyone who watched the spring 1978 NBC presentation of Holocaust was aware that at least part of the program was intended as a justification for Zionism, even while at about the same time Israeli troops in Lebanon produced devastation, thousands of civilian casualties, and untold suffering of a sort likened by a few courageous reporters to the U.S. devastation of Vietnam, see, for example, HDS Greenway, Vietnam-style raids gut South Lebanon, Israel leaves a path of destruction, Washington. Post, March 25, 1978. Similarly, the Fuhrer created by the package deal in early 1978 as a result of which U.S. warplanes were sold to Israel, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia made the predicament of Arab liberation interlocking with right-wing Arab regimes even more acute. The task of criticism, or, to put it another way, the role of the critical consciousness in such cases is to be able to make distinctions, to produce differences where at present there are none. To write critically about Zionism in Palestine has therefore never meant, and does not mean now, being anti-Semitic. Conversely, the struggle for Palestinian rights and self-determination does not mean support for the Saudi royal family, nor for the antiquated and oppressive state structures of most of the Arab nations. One must admit, however, that all liberals and even most radicals have been unable to overcome the Zionist habit of equating anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. Any well-meaning person can thus oppose South African or American racism and at the same time tacitly support Zionist racial discrimination against non-Jews in Palestine. The almost total absence of any handily available historical knowledge from non-Zionist sources, the dissemination by the media of malicious simplifications, e.g. Jews versus Arabs, the cynical opportunism of various Zionist pressure groups, the tendency endemic to university intellectuals uncritically to repeat cant phrases and political cliches, this is the role Gramsci assigned to traditional intellectuals, that of being experts in legitimation, the fear of treading upon the highly sensitive terrain of what Jews did to their victims. In an age of genocidal extermination of Jews, all this contributes to the dulling, regulated enforcement of almost unanimous support for Israel. But, as I, F. Stone recently noted, this unanimity exceeds even the Zionism of most Israelis. On the other hand, it would be totally unjust to neglect the power of Zionism as an idea for Jews, or to minimize the complex internal debates characterizing Zionism, its true meaning, its messianic destiny, etc. Even to speak about this subject, much less than attempting to define Zionism, is for an Arab quite a difficult matter, but it must honestly be looked at. Let me use myself as an example. Most of my education, and certainly all of my basic intellectual formation, are Western, in what I have read, in what I write about, even in what I do politically, I am profoundly influenced by mainstream Western attitudes toward the history of the Jews, anti-Semitism, the destruction of European Jewry. Unlike most other Arab intellectuals, the majority of whom obviously have not had my kind of background, I have been directly exposed to those aspects of Jewish history and experience that have mattered singularly for Jews and for Western non-Jews reading and thinking about Jewish history. I know as well as any educated Western non-Jew can know what anti-Semitism has meant for the Jews, especially in this century. 
Consequently I can understand the intertwined terror and the exultation out of which Zionism has been nourished, and I think I can at least grasp the meaning of Israel for Jews, and even for the enlightened Western liberal. And yet, because I am an Arab-Palestinian, I can also see and feel other things, and it is these things that complicate matters considerably, that cause me also to focus on Zionism's other aspects. The result is, I think, worth describing, not because what I think is so crucial, but because it is useful to see the same phenomenon in two complementary ways, not normally associated with each other. One can begin with a literary example, George Eliot's last novel, Daniel Deronda. The unusual thing about the book is that its main subject is Zionism, although the novel's principal themes are recognizable to anyone who has read Eliot's earlier fiction. Seen in the context of Eliot's general interest in idealism and spiritual yearning, Zionism for her was one in a series of worldly projects for the 19th century mind still committed to hopes for a secular religious community. In her earlier books, Eliot had studied a variety of enthusiasms, all of them replacements for organized religion, all of them attractive to persons who would have been Saint Teresa had they lived during a period of coherent faith. The reference to Saint Teresa was originally made by Eliot in Middlemarch, an earlier novel of hers. In using it to describe the novel's heroine, Dorothea Brooke, Eliot had intended to complement her own visionary and moral energy, sustained despite the absence in the modern world of certain assurances for faith and knowledge. Dorothea emerges at the end of Middlemarch as a chastened woman, forced to concede her grand visions of a fulfilled life in return for a relatively modest domestic success as a wife and mother. It is this considerably diminished view of things that Daniel Deronda, and Zionism in particular, revise upward, toward a genuinely hopeful socio-religious project in which individual energies can be merged and identified with a collective national vision, the whole emanating out of Judaism. The novel's plot alternates between the presentation of a bitter comedy of manners involving a surprisingly rootless segment of the British upper bourgeoisie, and the gradual revelation to Daniel Deronda, an exotic young man whose parentage is unknown but who is the ward of Sir Hugo Mallinger, a British aristocrat, of his Jewish identity and, when he becomes the spiritual disciple of Mordecai Ezra Cohen, his Jewish destiny. At the end of the novel, Daniel marries Mira, Mordecai's sister, and commits himself to fulfilling Mordecai's hopes for the future of the Jews. Mordecai dies as the young pair get married, although it is clear well before his death that his Zionist ideas have been passed on to Daniel, so much so that among the newlyweds' splendid wedding gifts is a complete equipment for travel provided by Sir Hugo and Lady Mallinger. For Daniel and his wife will be traveling to Palestine, presumably to set the great Zionist plan in motion. The crucial thing about the way Zionism is presented in the novel is that its backdrop is a generalized condition of homelessness. Not only the Jews, but even the well-born Englishmen and women in the novel are portrayed as wandering and alienated beings. If the novel's poorer English people, for example, Mrs. Davilo and her daughters, seem always to be moving from one rented house to another, the wealthy aristocrats are no less cut off from some permanent home. Thus Eliot uses the plight of the Jews to make a universal statement about the 19th century's need for a home, given the spiritual and psychological rootlessness reflected in her character's almost ontological physical restlessness. Her interest in Zionism therefore can be traced to her reflection, made early in the novel, that a human life, I think, should be well rooted in some spot of a native land, where it may get the love of tender kindship for the face of the earth, for the labors men go forth to, for the sounds and accents that haunt it, for whatever will give that early home a familiar, unmistakable difference amidst the future widening of knowledge. To find the early home means to find the place where originally one was at home, a task to be undertaken more or less interchangeably by individuals and by people. It becomes historically appropriate therefore that those individuals and that people best suited to the task are Jews. Only the Jews as a people, and consequently as individuals, have retained both a sense of their original home in Zion and an acute, always contemporary, feeling of loss. Despite the prevalence of anti-Semitism everywhere, the Jews are a reproach to the Gentiles who have long since forsaken the observance of any civilizing communal belief. 
Thus Mordecai puts these sentiments positively as a definite program for today's Jews, they, the Gentiles, scorn our people's ignorant observance, but the most accursed ignorance is that which has no observance, sunk to the cunning greed of the fox, to which all law is no more than a trap or the cry of the worrying hound. There is a degradation deep down below the memory that has withered into superstition. In the multitudes of the ignorant on three continents who observe our rites and make the confession of the divine unity, the soul of Judaism is not dead. Revive the organic center, let the unity of Israel which has made the growth and form of its religion be an outward reality. Looking towards a land and a polity, our dispersed people in all the ends of the earth may share the dignity of a national life which has a voice among the peoples of the East and the West, which will plant the wisdom and skill of our race so that it may be, as of old, a medium of transmission and understanding. Let that come to pass, and the living warmth will spread to the weak extremities of Israel, and superstition will vanish, not in the lawlessness of the renegade, but in the illumination of great facts which widen feeling and make all knowledge alive as the young offspring of beloved memories. The illumination of great facts which widen feeling is a typical phrase for Eliot, and there is no doubt that her approbation for her Zionists derives from her belief that they were a group almost exactly expressing her own grand ideas about an expanded life of feelings. Yet if there is a felt reality about the peoples of the West, there is no such reality for the peoples of the East. They are named, it is true, but are no more substantial than a phrase. The few references to the East in Daniel Deronda are always to England's Indian colonies, for whose people, as people having wishes, values, aspirations, Eliot expresses the complete indifference of absolute silence. Of the fact that Zion will be planted in the East, Eliot takes no very detailed account, it is as if the phrase the people of the East and the West covers what will, territorially at least, be a neutral inaugural reality. In turn, that reality will be replaced by a permanent accomplishment when the newly founded state becomes the medium of transmission and understanding. For how could Eliot imagine that even Eastern people would object to such grand benefits for all? There is, however, a disturbing insistence on these matters when Mordecai continues his speech. For him, Zionism means that our race takes on again the character of a nationality, a labor which shall be a worthy fruit of the long anguish whereby our fathers maintained their separateness, refusing the ease of falsehood. Zionism is to be a dramatic lesson for mankind. But what ought to catch the reader's attention about the way Mordecai illustrates his thesis is his depiction of the land, the Jews have wealth enough to redeem the soil from debauched and paupered conquerors, they have the skill of the statesman to devise, the tongue of the orator to persuade. And is there no prophet or poet among us to make the ears of Christian Europe tingle with shame at the hideous obloquy of Christian strife which the Turk gazes at? The reference here is to the long history of European disputes about the Holy Land, as at the fighting of beasts to which he has lent an arena? There is a store of wisdom among us to found a new Jewish polity, grand, simple, just like the old, a republic where there is a quality of protection, an equality which shone like a star on the forehead of our ancient community, and gave it more than the brightness of Western freedom amid the despotisms of the East. Then our race shall have an organic center, a heart and brain to watch and guide and execute. The outraged Jew shall have a defense in the court of nations, as the outraged Englishman or American and the world will gain as Israel gains. For there will be a community in the van of the East which carries the culture and the sympathies of every great nation in its bosom, there will be a land set for a halting place of enmities, a neutral ground for the East as Belgium is for the West. Difficulties? I know there are difficulties. But let the spirit of sublime achievement move in the great among our people, and the work will begin. The land itself is characterized in two separate ways. On the one hand, it is associated with debauched and paupered conquerors, an arena lent by the Turk to fighting beasts, a part of the despotic East, on the other, with the brightness of Western freedom, with nations like England and America, with the idea of neutrality, Belgium. In short, with a degraded and unworthy East and a noble, enlightened West. The bridge between those warring representatives of East and West will be Zionism. Interestingly, Eliot cannot sustain her admiration of Zionism except by seeing it as a method for transforming the East into the West. 
This is not to say that she does not have sympathy for Zionism and for the Jews themselves, she obviously does. But there is a whole area of Jewish experience lying somewhere between longing for a homeland, which everyone, including the Gentile, feels, and actually getting it, that she is dim about. Otherwise she is quite capable of seeing that Zionism can easily be accommodated to several varieties of Western, as opposed to Eastern, thought, principle among them the idea that the East is degraded, that it needs reconstruction according to enlightened Western notions about politics, that any reconstructed portion of the East can with small reservations become as English as England to its new inhabitants. Underlying all this, however, is the total absence of any thought about the actual inhabitants of the East, Palestine in particular. They are irrelevant both to the Zionists in Daniel Deronda and to the English characters. Brightness, freedom, and redemption, key matters for Eliot, are to be restricted to Europeans and the Jews, who are themselves European prototypes so far as colonizing the East is concerned. There is a remarkable failure when it comes to taking anything non-European into consideration although curiously all of Eliot's descriptions of Jews stress their exotic, Eastern aspects. Humanity and sympathy, it seems, are not endowments of anything but an Occidental mentality, to look for them in the despotic East, much less find them, is to waste one's time. Two points need to be made immediately. One is that Eliot is no different from other European apostles of sympathy, humanity, and understanding for whom noble sentiments were either left behind in Europe or made programmatically inapplicable outside Europe. There are the chastening examples of John Stuart Mill and Karl Marx, both of whom I have discussed in Orientalism, two thinkers known doctrinally to be opponents of injustice and oppression. Yet both of them seem to have believed that such ideas as liberty, representative government, and individual happiness must not be applied in the Orient for reasons that today we would call racist. The fact is that 19th century European culture was racist with a greater or lesser degree of virulence depending on the individual. The French writer Ernest Renat, for instance, was an outright anti Semite. Eliot was indifferent to races who could not be assimilated to European ideas. Here we come to the second point. Eliot's account of Zionism in Daniel Deronda was intended as a sort of assenting Gentile response to prevalent Jewish Zionist currents, the novel therefore serves as an indication of how much in Zionism was legitimated and indeed valorized by Gentile European thought. On one important issue there was complete agreement between the Gentile and Jewish versions of Zionism, their view of the Holy Land as essentially empty of inhabitants, not because there were no inhabitants, there were, and they were frequently described in numerous travel accounts, in novels like Benjamin Disraeli's Tancred, even in the various 19th century Baedekers, but because their status as sovereign and human inhabitants was systematically denied. While it may be possible to differentiate between Jewish and Gentile Zionists on this point, they ignored the Arab inhabitants for different reasons, the Palestinian Arab was ignored nonetheless. That is what needs emphasis, the extent to which the roots of Jewish and Gentile Zionism are in the culture of high liberal capitalism and how the work of its vanguard liberals like George Eliot reinforced, perhaps also completed, that culture's less attractive tendencies. None of what I have so far said applies adequately to what Zionism meant for Jews or what it represented as an advanced idea for enthusiastic non-Jews. It applies exclusively to those less fortunate beings who happen to be living on the land, people of whom no notice was taken. What has too long been forgotten is that while important European thinkers considered the desirable and later the probable fate of Palestine, the land was being tilled, villages and towns built and lived in by thousands of natives who believed that it was their homeland. In the meantime their actual physical being was ignored, later it became a troublesome detail. Strikingly, therefore, Eliot sounds very much like Moses Hess, an early Zionist idealist who in his Rome and Jerusalem uses the same theoretical language to be given to Mordecai, what we have to do at present for the regeneration of the Jewish nation is, first, to keep alive the hope of the political rebirth of our people, and, next, to reawaken that hope where it slumbers. When political conditions in the Orient shape themselves so as to permit the organization of a beginning of the restoration of the Jewish state, this beginning will express itself in the founding of Jewish colonies in the land of their ancestors, to which enterprise France will undoubtedly lend a hand. 
France, beloved friend, is the savior who will restore our people to its place in universal history. Just as we once searched in the West for a road to India and incidentally discovered a new world, so will our lost fatherland be rediscovered on the road to India and China that is now being built in the Orient. Hess continues his pee into France, since every Zionist saw one or another of the imperial powers as patron, by quoting at some length from Ernest Laharon's The New Eastern Question, from which Hess draws the following passage for his peroration, a great calling is reserved for the Jews, to be a living channel of communication between three continents. You shall be the bearers of civilization to peoples who are still inexperienced and their teachers in the European sciences, to which your race has contributed so much. You shall be the mediators between Europe and far Asia, opening the roads that lead to India and China, those unknown regions which must ultimately be thrown open to civilization. You will come to the land of your fathers decorated with the crown of age-long martyrdom, and there, finally, you will be completely healed from all your ills. Your capital will again bring the wide stretches of barren land under cultivation, your labor and industry will once more turn the ancient soil into fruitful valleys, reclaiming it from the encroaching sands of the desert, and the world will again pay its homage to the oldest of peoples. Between them, Hess and Eliot concur that Zionism is to be carried out by the Jews with the assistance of major European powers, that Zionism will restore a lost fatherland, and in so doing mediate between the various civilizations, that present-day Palestine was in need of cultivation, civilization, reconstitution, that Zionism would finally bring enlightenment and progress where at present there was neither. The three ideas that depended on one another in Hess and Eliot, and later in almost every Zionist thinker or ideologue, are a, the non-existent Arab inhabitants, b, the complementary Western Jewish attitude to an empty territory, and c, the restorative Zionist project, which would repeat by rebuilding a vanished Jewish state and combine it with modern elements like disciplined, separate colonies a special agency for land acquisition, etc. Of course, none of these ideas would have any force. Were it not for the additional fact of their being addressed to, shaped for, and out of an international, i.e., non-oriental and hence European, context. This context was the reality, not only because of the ethnocentric rationale governing the whole project, but also because of the overwhelming facts of diaspora realities and imperialist hegemony over the entire gamut of European culture. It needs to be remarked, however, that Zionism, like the view of America as an empty land held by Puritans, was a colonial vision unlike that of most other 19th-century European powers, for whom the natives of outlying territories were included in the redemptive mission of Illicitris. From the earliest phases of its modern evolution until it culminated in the creation of Israel, Zionism appealed to a European audience for whom the classification of overseas territories and natives into various uneven classes was canonical and natural. That is why, for example, every single state or movement in the formerly colonized territories of Africa and Asia today identifies with, fully supports, and understands the Palestinian struggle. In many instances, as I hope to show presently, there is an unmistakable coincidence between the experiences of Arab Palestinians at the hands of Zionism and the experiences of those black, yellow, and brown people who were described as inferior and subhuman by 19th century imperialists. For although it coincided with an era of the most virulent Western anti-Semitism, Zionism also coincided with the period of unparalleled European territorial acquisition in Africa and Asia, and it was as part of this general movement of acquisition and occupation that Zionism was launched initially by Theodor Herzl. During the latter part of the greatest period in European colonial expansion, Zionism also made its crucial first moves along the way to getting what has now become a sizable Asiatic territory. And it is important to remember that in joining the general Western enthusiasm for overseas territorial acquisition, Zionism never spoke of itself unambiguously as a Jewish liberation movement, but rather as a Jewish movement for colonial settlement in the Orient. To those Palestinian victims that Zionism displaced, it cannot have meant anything by way of sufficient cause that Jews were victims of European anti-Semitism and, given Israel's continued oppression of Palestinians, few Palestinians are able to see beyond their reality, namely, that once victims themselves, Occidental Jews in Israel have become oppressors, of Palestinian Arabs and Oriental Jews. 
These are not intended to be backward-looking historical observations, for in a very vital way they explain and even determine much of what now happens in the Middle East. The fact that no sizable segment of the Israeli population has as yet been able to confront the terrible social and political injustice done the native Palestinians is an indication of how deeply ingrained are the, by now, anomalous imperialist perspectives basic to Zionism, its view of the world, its sense of an inferior native other. The fact also that no Palestinian, regardless of his political stripe, has been able to reconcile himself to Zionism suggests the extent to which, for the Palestinian, Zionism has appeared to be an uncompromisingly exclusionary, discriminatory, colonialist praxis. So powerful, and so unhesitatingly followed, has been the radical Zionist distinction between privileged Jews in Palestine and unprivileged non-Jews there, that nothing else has emerged, no perception of suffering human existence has escaped from the two camps created thereby. As a result, it has been impossible for Jews to understand the human tragedy caused the Arab Palestinians by Zionism, and it has been impossible for Arab Palestinians to see in Zionism anything except an ideology and a practice keeping them, and Israeli Jews, imprisoned. But in order to break down the iron circle of inhumanity, we must see how it was forged, and there it is ideas and culture themselves that play the major role. Consider Herzl. If it was the Dreyfus affair that first brought him to Jewish consciousness, it was the idea of overseas colonial settlement for the Jews that came to him at roughly the same time as an antidote for anti-Semitism. The idea itself was current at the end of the 19th century, even as an idea for Jews. Herzl's first significant contact was Baron Maurice de Hirsch, a wealthy philanthropist who had for some time been behind the Jewish Colonization Association for helping Eastern Jews to emigrate to Argentina and Brazil. Later, Herzl thought generally about South America, then about Africa as places for establishing a Jewish colony. Both areas were widely acceptable as places for European colonialism, and that Herzl's mind followed along the orthodox imperialist track of his period is perhaps understandable. The impressive thing, however, is the degree to which Herzl had absorbed and internalized the imperialist perspective on natives and their territory. There could have been no doubt whatever in Herzl's mind that Palestine in the late 19th century was peopled. True, it was under Ottoman administration, and therefore already a colony, but it had been the subject of numerous travel accounts, most of them famous, by Lamartine, Chateaubriand, Flaubert, and others. Yet even if he had not read these authors, Herzl as a journalist must surely have looked at a Baedeker to ascertain that Palestine was indeed inhabited by, in the 1880s, 650,000 mostly Arab people. This did not stop him from regarding their presence as manageable in ways that, in his diary, he spelled out with a rather chilling prescience for what later took place. The mass of poor natives were to be expropriated and, he added, both the expropriation and the removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly. This was to be done by spiriting the penniless population across the border by procuring employment for it in the transit countries, while denying it any employment in our own country. With uncannily accurate cynicism, Herzl predicted that the small class of large landowners could be had for a price, as indeed they were. The whole scheme for displacing the native population of Palestine far outstripped any of the then-current plans for taking over vast reaches of Africa. As Desmond Stewart aptly says, Herzl seems to have foreseen that in going further than any colonialist had so far gone in Africa, he would, temporarily, alienate civilized opinion. At first, incidentally, he writes on the pages describing involuntary expropriation, people will avoid us. We are in bad odor. By the time the reshaping of world opinion in our favor has been completed, we shall be firmly established in our country, no longer fearing the influx of foreigners, and receiving our visitors with aristocratic benevolence and proud amiability. This was not a prospect to charm a peon in Argentina or a fella in Palestine. But Herzl did not intend his diary for immediate publication. One need not wholly accept the conspiratorial tone of these comments, whether Herzl's or Stewart's, to grant that world opinion has not been, until during the 60s and 70s when the Palestinians forced their presence on world politics, very much concerned with the expropriation of Palestine. 
I said earlier that in this regard the major Zionist achievement was getting international legitimization for its own accomplishments, thereby making the Palestinian cost of these accomplishments seem to be irrelevant. But it is clear from Herzl's thinking that that could not have been done unless there was a prior European inclination to view the natives as irrelevant to begin with. That is, those natives already fit a more or less acceptable classificatory grid, which made them sway generous inferior to Western or white men, and it is this grid that Zionists like Herzl appropriated, domesticating it from the general culture of their time to the unique needs of a developing Jewish nationalism. One needs to repeat that what in Zionism served the no doubt justified ends of Jewish tradition, saving the Jews as a people from homelessness and anti-Semitism and restoring them to nationhood, also collaborated with those aspects of the dominant Western culture in which Zionism institutionally lived, making it possible for Europeans to view non-Europeans as inferior, marginal, and irrelevant. For the Palestinian Arab, Therefore, it is the collaboration that has counted, not by any means the good done to Jews. The Arab has been on the receiving end not of benign Zionism, which has been restricted to Jews, but of an essentially discriminatory and powerful culture, of which, in Palestine, Zionism has been the agent. Here I must digress to say that the great difficulty today of writing about what has happened to the Arab Palestinian as a result of Zionism is that Zionism has had a large number of successes. There is no doubt in my mind, for example, that most Jews do regard Zionism and Israel as urgently important facts for Jewish life, particularly because of what happened to the Jews in this century. Then too, Israel has some remarkable political and cultural achievements to its credit, quite apart from its spectacular military successes until recently. Most important, Israel is a subject about which, on the whole, one can feel positive with less reservations than the ones experienced in thinking about the Arabs, who are outlandish, strange, hostile Orientals after all, surely that is an obvious fact to anyone living in the West. Together these successes of Zionism have produced a prevailing view of the question of Palestine that almost totally favors the victor, and takes hardly any account of the victim. Yet what did the victim feel as he watched the Zionists arriving in Palestine? What does he think as he watches Zionism described today? Where does he look in Zionism's history to locate its roots and the origins of its practices toward him? These are the questions that are never asked, and they are precisely the ones that I am trying to raise, as well as answer, here in this examination of the links between Zionism and European imperialism. My interest is in trying to record the effects of Zionism on its victims, and these effects can only be studied genealogically in the framework provided by imperialism, even during the 19th century when Zionism was still an idea and not a state called Israel. For the Palestinian now who writes critically to see what his or her history has meant, and who tries, as I am now trying, to see what Zionism has been for the Palestinians, Antonio Gramsci's observation is relevant, that the consciousness of what one really is, is knowing thyself as a product of the historical process to date which has deposited in you an infinity of traces, without leaving an inventory. The job of producing an inventory is a first necessity, Gramsci continued, and so it must be now, when the inventory of what Zionism's victims, not its beneficiaries, endured is rarely exposed to public view. If we have become accustomed to making fastidious distinctions between ideology, or theory, and practice, we shall be more accurate historically if we do not do so glibly in the case of the European imperialism that actually annexed most of the world during the 19th century. Imperialism was and still is a political philosophy whose aim and purpose for being is territorial expansion and its legitimization. A serious underestimation of imperialism, however, would be to consider territory in too literal a way. Gaining and holding an imperium means gaining and holding a domain, which includes a variety of operations, among them constituting an area, accumulating its inhabitants, having power over its ideas, people, and of course, its land, converting people, land, and ideas to the purposes and for the use of a hegemonic imperial design, all this as a result of being able to treat reality appropriatively. Thus the distinction between an idea that one feels to be one's own and a piece of land that one claims by right to be one's own, despite the presence on the land of its working native inhabitants, is really non-existent, at least in the world of 19th-century culture out of which imperialism developed. 
laying claim to an idea and laying claim to a territory, given the extraordinarily current idea that the non-European world was there to be claimed, occupied, and ruled by Europe, were considered to be different sides of the same, essentially constitutive activity, which had the force, the prestige, and the authority of science. Moreover, because in such fields as biology, philology, and geology the scientific consciousness was principally a reconstituting, restoring, and transforming activity turning old fields into new ones, the link between an outright imperialist attitude toward distant lands in the Orient and a scientific attitude to the inequalities of race was that both attitudes depended on the European will, on the determining force necessary to change confusing or useless realities into an orderly disciplined set of new classifications useful to Europe. Thus in the works of Carolus Linnaeus, Georges Buffon, and Georges Cuvier the white races became scientifically different from reds, yellows, blacks, and browns, and, consequently, territories occupied by those races also newly became vacant, open to western colonies, developments, plantations, and settlers. Additionally, the less equal races were made useful by being turned into what the white race studied and came to understand as a part of its racial and cultural hegemony, as in Joseph de Gobineau and Oswald Spangler. Or, following the impulse of outright colonialism, these lesser races were put to direct use in the empire. When in 1918, George Clemenceau stated that he believed he had an unlimited right of levying black troops to assist in the defense of French territory in Europe if France were attacked in the future by Germany, he was saying that by some scientific right France had the knowledge and the power to convert blacks into what Raymond Poiré called an economic form of gun fodder for the white Frenchman. Imperialism, of course, cannot be blamed on science, but what needs to be seen is the relative ease with which science could be deformed into a rationalization for imperial domination. Supporting the taxonomy of a natural history deformed into a social anthropology whose real purpose was social control was the taxonomy of linguistics. With the discovery of a structural affinity between groups or families of languages by such linguists as Franz Bopp, William Jones, and Friedrich von Schlegel, there began as well the unwarranted extension of an idea about language families into theories of human types having determined ethnocultural and racial characteristics. In 1808, as an instance, Schlegel discerned a clear rift between the Indo-Germanic, or Aryan, languages on the one hand and, on the other, the Semitic African languages. The former, he said, were creative, regenerative, lively, and aesthetically pleasing, the latter were mechanical in their operations, unregenerate, passive. From this kind of distinction, Schlegel, and later Rena, went on to generalize about the great distance separating a superior Aryan and an inferior non-Aryan mind, culture, and society. Perhaps the most effective deformation or translation of science into something more accurately resembling political administration took place in the amorphous field assembling together jurisprudence, social philosophy, and political theory. First of all, a fairly influential tradition in philosophic empiricism, recently studied by Harry Bracken, seriously advocated a type of racial distinction that divided humankind into lesser and greater breeds of men. The actual problems, in England, mainly, of dealing with a 300-year-old Indian empire, as well as numerous voyages of discovery, made it possible scientifically to show that some cultures were advanced and civilized, others backward and uncivilized. These ideas, plus the lasting social meaning imparted to the fact of color, and hence of race, by philosophers like John Locke and David Hume, made it axiomatic by the middle of the 19th century that Europeans always ought to rule non. Europeans. This doctrine was reinforced in other ways, some of which had a direct bearing, I think, on Zionist practice and vision in Palestine. Among the supposed juridical distinctions between civilized and non-civilized peoples was an attitude toward land, almost a doxology about land, which non-civilized people supposedly lacked. A civilized man, it was believed, could cultivate the land because it meant something to him, on it, accordingly, he bred useful arts and crafts, he created, he accomplished, he built. For an uncivilized people, land was either farmed badly, i.e., inefficiently by Western standards, or it was left to rot. 
From this string of ideas, by which whole native societies who lived on American, African, and Asian territories for centuries were suddenly denied their right to live on that land, came the great dispossessing movements of modern European colonialism, and with them all the schemes for redeeming the land, resettling the natives, civilizing them, taming their savage customs, turning them into useful beings under European rule. Land in Asia, Africa, and the Americas was there for European exploitation, because Europe understood the value of land in a way impossible for the natives. At the end of the century, Joseph Conrad dramatized this philosophy in Heart of Darkness and embodied it powerfully in the figure of Kurtz, a man whose colonial dreams for the Earth's dark places were made by all Europe. But what Conrad drew on, as indeed the Zionists drew on also, was the kind of philosophy set forth by Robert Knox in his work The Races of Man, in which men were divided into white and advanced, the producers, and dark, inferior wasters. Similarly, thinkers like John Westlake and before him Emmer de Vattel divided the world's territories into empty, though inhabited by nomads, and a low kind of society, and civilized, and the former were then revised as being ready for takeover on the basis of a higher, civilized right to them. I very greatly simplified the transformation in perspective by which millions of acres outside metropolitan Europe were thus declared empty, their people and societies decreed to be obstacles to progress and development, their space just as assertively declared open to European white settlers and their civilizing exploitation. During the 1870s in particular, new European geographical societies mushroomed as a sign that geography had become, according to Lord Curzon, the most cosmopolitan of all the sciences. Not for nothing in Heart of Darkness did Marlowe admit to his passion for maps. I would look for hours at South America, or Africa, or Australia, and lose myself in all the glories of exploration. At that time there were many blank spaces, populated by natives, that is, on the earth, and when I saw one that looked particularly inviting on a map, but they all look like that, I would put my finger on it and say, when I grow up I will go there. Geography and a passion for maps developed into an organized matter mainly devoted to acquiring vast overseas territories. And, Conrad also said, this conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. What redeems it is the idea only. An idea at the back of it, not a sentimental pretense but an idea, something you can set up, and bow down before, and offer a sacrifice to. Conrad makes the point better than anyone, I think. The power to conquer territory is only in part a matter of physical force, there is the strong moral and intellectual component making the conquest itself secondary to an idea, which dignifies, and indeed hastens, pure force with arguments drawn from science, morality, ethics, and a general philosophy. Everything in Western culture potentially capable of dignifying the acquisition of new domains, as a new science, for example, acquires new intellectual territory for itself, could be put at the service of colonial adventures. And was put, the idea always informing the conquest, making it entirely palatable. One example of such an idea spoken about openly as a quite normal justification for what today would be called colonial aggression is to be found in these passages by Paul Leroy Beaulieu, a leading French geographer in the 1870s, a society colonizes, when having itself reached a high degree of maturity and of strength, it procreates, it protects, it places in good conditions of development, and it brings to virility a new society to which it has given birth. Colonization is one of the most complex and delicate phenomena of social physiology. There is no question of consulting the natives of the territory where the new society is to be given birth. What counts is that a modern European society has enough vitality and intellect to be magnified by this pouring out of its exuberant activity on the outside. Such activity must be good since it is believed in, and since it also carries within itself the healthy current of an entire advanced civilization. Therefore, Leroy Beaulieu added, colonization is the expansive force of a people, it is its power of reproduction, it is its enlargement and its multiplication through space, it is the subjugation of the universe or a vast part of it to that people's language, customs, ideas, and laws. Imperialism was the theory, 
colonialism the practice of changing the uselessly unoccupied territories of the world into useful new versions of the European metropolitan society. Everything in those territories that suggested waste, disorder, uncounted resources, was to be converted into productivity, order, taxable, potentially developed wealth. You get rid of most of the offending human and animal blight, whether because it simply sprawls untidily all over the place or because it roams around unproductively and uncounted, and you can find the rest to reservations, compounds, native homelands, where you can count, tax, use them profitably, and you build a new society on the vacated space. Thus was Europe reconstituted abroad, its multiplication in space successfully projected and managed. The result was a widely varied group of little Europes scattered throughout Asia, Africa, and the Americas, each reflecting the circumstances, the specific instrumentalities of the parent culture, its pioneers, its vanguard settlers. All of them were similar in one other major respect, despite the differences, which were considerable, and that was that their life was carried on with an air of normality. The most grotesque reproductions of Europe, South Africa, Rhodesia, etc., were considered appropriate, the worst discrimination against and exclusions of the natives were thought to be normal because scientifically legitimate, the sheer contradiction of living a foreign life in an enclave many physical and cultural miles from Europe, in the midst of hostile and uncomprehending natives, gave rise to a sense of history, a stubborn kind of logic, a social and political state decreeing the present. Colonial venture as normal, justified, good. With specific reference to Palestine, what were to become institutional Zionist attitudes to the Arab Palestinian natives and their supposed claims to a normal existence were more than prepared for in the attitudes and the practices of British scholars, administrators, and experts who were officially involved in the exploitation and government of Palestine since the mid 19th century. Consider that in 1903 the Bishop of Salisbury told members of the Palestine Exploration Fund that nothing, I think, that has been discovered makes us feel any regret at the suppression of Canaanite civilization, the euphemism for native Arab Palestinians, by Israelite civilization. The excavations show how the Bible has not misrepresented at all the abomination of the Canaanite culture which was superseded by the Israelite culture. Miriam Rosen, a young American scholar, has compiled a spine-tingling collection of typical British attitudes to the Palestinians, attitudes which in extraordinary ways prepare for the official Zionist view, from Weizmann to begin, of the native Palestinian. Here are some citations from Ms. Rosen's important work, Turwit Drake, who wrote in a survey of Western Palestine, the fear of the Fellaheen that we have secret designs of reconquering the country is a fruitful source of difficulty. This got over, remains the crass stupidity which cannot give a direct answer to a simple question, the exact object of which it does not understand. For why should a Frank wish to know the name of an insignificant wadi or hill in their land? The fellaheen are all in the worst type of humanity that I have come across in the East, the fella is totally destitute of all moral sense. The Dean of Westminster, on the obstacles before the Palestine Exploration Fund survey, and these labors had to be carried out, not with the assistance of those on the spot, but in spite of the absurd obstacles thrown in the way of work by that singular union of craft, ignorance and stupidity, which can only be found in Orientals. Lord Kitchener on the survey of Galilee, we hope to rescue from the hands of that ruthless destroyer, the uneducated Arab, one of the most interesting ruins in Palestine, hallowed by footprints of our Lord. I allude to the synagogue of Capernaum, which is rapidly disappearing owing to the stones being burnt for lime. 1c. Our condor in his present condition of Palestine, the native peasantry are well worth a few words of description. They are brutally ignorant, fanatical, and above all, inveterate liars, yet they have qualities which would, if developed, render them a useful population. He cites their cleverness, energy, and endurance for pain, heat, etc. Sir Flinders Petrie, the Arab has a vast balance of romance put to his credit very needlessly. He is as disgustingly incapable as most other savages, and no more worth romancing about than Red Indians or Maoris. I shall be glad to return to the comparatively shrewd and sensible Egyptians. Charles Claremont Gano's reflections on the Arabs in Palestine, Arab civilization is a mere deception, it no more exists than the horrors of Arab conquest. 
It is but the last gleam of Greek and Roman civilization gradually dying out in the powerless but respectful hands of Islam. Were Stanley Cook's view of the country, rapid deterioration, which, it would seem, was only temporarily stopped by the energetic crusaders. Modern travelers have often noticed the inherent weakness of the characters of the inhabitants and, like Robinson, have realized that, for the return of prosperity, nothing is wanted but the hand of the man to till the ground. Or, finally, R. S. McAllister, it is no exaggeration to say that throughout these long centuries the native inhabitants of Palestine do not appear to have made a single contribution of any kind whatsoever to material civilization. It was perhaps the most unprogressive country on the face of the earth. Its entire culture was derivative. These, then, are some of the main points that must be made about the background of Zionism in European imperialist or colonialist attitudes. For whatever it may have done for Jews, Zionism essentially saw Palestine as the European imperialists did, as an empty territory paradoxically filled with ignoble or perhaps even dispensable natives. It allied itself, as Heim Weizmann quite clearly said after World War I, with the imperial powers in carrying out its plans for establishing a new Jewish state in Palestine, and it did not think except in negative terms of the natives, who were passively supposed to accept the plans made for their land, as even Zionist historians like Yehoshua Porath and Neville Mandel have empirically shown. The ideas of Jewish colonizers in Palestine, well before World War I, always met with unmistakable. Native resistance, not because the natives thought that Jews were evil, but because most natives do not take kindly to having their territory settled by foreigners, moreover, in formulating the concept of a Jewish nation reclaiming its own territory, Zionism not only accepted the generic racial concepts of European culture, it also banked on the fact that Palestine was actually peopled not by an advanced but by a backward people, over which it ought to be dominant. Thus that implicit assumption of domination led specifically in the case of Zionism to the practice of ignoring the natives for the most part as not entitled to serious consideration. Zionism therefore developed with a unique consciousness of itself, but with little or nothing left over for the unfortunate natives. Maxime Rodinson is perfectly correct in saying that Zionist indifference to the Palestinian natives was an indifference linked to European supremacy, which benefited even Europe's proletarians and oppressed minorities. In fact, there can be no doubt that if the ancestral homeland had been occupied by one of the well-established industrialized nations that ruled the world at the time, one that had thoroughly settled down in a territory it had infused with a powerful national consciousness, then the problem of displacing German, French, or English inhabitants and introducing a new, nationally coherent element into the middle of their homeland would have been in the forefront of the consciousness of even the most ignorant and destitute Zionists. In short, all the constitutive energies of Zionism were premised on the excluded presence, that is, the functional absence of native people in Palestine, institutions were built deliberately shutting out the natives, laws were drafted when Israel came into being that made sure the natives would remain in their non-place, Jews in theirs, and so on. It is no wonder that today the one issue that electrifies Israel as a society is the problem of the Palestinians, whose negation is the most consistent thread running through Zionism. And it is this perhaps unfortunate aspect of Zionism that ties it ineluctably to imperialism, at least so far as the Palestinian is concerned. Rodinson again, the element that made it possible to connect these aspirations of Jewish shopkeepers, peddlers, craftsmen, and intellectuals in Russia and elsewhere to the conceptual orbit of imperialism was one small detail that seemed to be of no importance, Palestine was inhabited by another people. 2. Zionist Population Palestinian depopulation. I have been discussing the extraordinary unevenness in Zionism between care for the Jews and an almost total disregard for the non-Jews or native Arab population in conceptual terms. Zionism and European imperialism are epistemologically, hence historically and politically, coterminous in their view of resident natives, but it is how this irreducibly imperialist view worked in the world of politics and in the lives of people for whom epistemology was irrelevant that justifies one's looking at epistemology at all. In that world and in those lives, among them several million Palestinians, the results can be detailed, not as mere theoretical visions, but as an immensely traumatic Zionist effectiveness. 
One general Arab-Palestinian reaction toward Zionism is perfectly caught, I think, in the following sentence written by the Arab delegations as reply in 1922 to Winston Churchill's white paper, the intention to create the Jewish national home is to cause the disappearance or subordination of the Arabic population, culture, and language. What generations of Palestinian Arabs watched therefore was an unfolding design, whose deeper roots in Jewish history and the terrible Jewish experience was necessarily obscured by what was taking place before their eyes as well as to those in Palestine. There the Arabs were able to see embodied a ruthless doctrine, calling for monastic self-discipline and cold detachment from environment. The Jews who gloried in the name of socialist worker interpreted brotherhood on a strictly nationalist, or racial basis, for they meant brotherhood with Jew, not with Arab. As they insisted on working the soil with their own hands, since exploitation of others was anathema to them, they excluded the Arabs from their regime, they believed in equality, but for themselves. They lived on Jewish bread, raised on Jewish soil that was protected by a Jewish rifle. The inventory of Palestinian experience that I am trying to take here is based on the simple truth that the exultant or, later, the terrorized Jews who arrived in Palestine were seen essentially as foreigners whose proclaimed destiny was to create a state for Jews. What of the Arabs who were there? Was the question we must feel ourselves asking now. What we will discover is that everything positive from the Zionist standpoint looked absolutely negative from the perspective of the native Arab Palestinians for they could never be fit into the grand vision. Not that vision was merely a theoretical matter, it was that and, as it was later to determine the character and even the details of Israeli government policy toward the native Arab Palestinians, vision was also the way Zionist leaders looked at the Arabs in order later, and certainly at that moment, to deal with them. Thus, as I said earlier, I have in mind the whole dialectic between theory and actual day-to-day -day effectiveness. My premise is that Israel developed as a social polity out of the Zionist thesis that Palestine's colonization was to be accomplished simultaneously for and by Jews and by the displacement of the Palestinians. Moreover, that in its conscious and declared ideas about Palestine, Zionism attempted first to minimize, then to eliminate, and then, all else failing, finally to subjugate the natives as a way of guaranteeing that Israel would not be simply the state of its citizens, which included Arabs, of course, but the state of the whole Jewish people, having a kind of sovereignty over land and peoples that no other state possessed or possesses. It is this anomaly that the Arab Palestinians have since been trying both to resist and provide an alternative for. One can learn a great deal from pronouncements made by strategically important Zionist leaders whose job it was, after Herzl, to translate the design into action. Heim Weizmann comes to mind at once, as much for his extraordinary personality as for his brilliant successes in bringing Zionism up from an idea to a conquering political institution. His thesis about the land of Palestine is revealing in the extent to which it repeats Herzl, it seems as if God has covered the soil of Palestine with rocks and marshes and sand, so that its beauty can only be brought out by those who love it and will devote their lives to healing its wounds. The context of this remark, however, is a sale made to the Zionists by a wealthy absentee landlord, the Lebanese Sursuk family, of unpromising marshland. Weizmann admits that this particular sale was of some, by no means a great deal, of Palestine, yet the impression he gives is of a whole territory essentially unused, unappreciated, misunderstood, if one can use such a word in this connection. Despite the people who lived on it, Palestine was therefore to be made useful, appreciated, understandable. The native inhabitants were believed curiously to be out of touch with history and, it seemed to follow, they were not really present. In the following passage, written by Weizmann to describe Palestine when he first visited there in 1907, notice how the contrast between past neglect and forlornness and present tone and progressive spirit, he was writing in 1941, is intended to justify the introduction of foreign colonies and settlements. A dolorous country it was on the whole, one of the most neglected corners of the miserably neglected Turkish Empire. Here, Weizmann uses neglect to describe Palestine's native inhabitants, the fact of whose residence there is not a sufficient reason to characterize Palestine as anything but an essentially empty and patient territory, awaiting people who show a proper care for it. 
Its total population was something above 600,000, of which about 80,000 were Jews. The latter lived mostly in the cities, but neither the colonies nor the city settlements in any way resembled, as far as vigor, tone and progressive spirit are concerned, the colonies and settlements of our day. One short-term gain was that Zionism raised the value of the land, and the Arabs could reap profits even if politically the land was being cut out from underneath them. As against native neglect and decrepitude, Weizmann preached the necessity of Jewish energy, will, and organization for reclaiming, redeeming the land. His language was shot through with the rhetoric of voluntarism, with an ideology of will and new blood that appropriated for Zionism a great deal of the language, and later the policies, of European colonialists attempting to deal with native backwardness. New blood had to be brought into the country, a new spirit of enterprise had to be introduced. The Jews were to be the importers of colonies and colonists whose role was not simply to take over a territory but also to be schools for a Jewish national self-revival. Thus if in Palestine there were great possibilities, the question became how to do something about the fact that the will was lacking. How was that to be awakened? How was a cumulative process to be set in motion? According to Weizmann, the Zionists were saved from ultimate discouragement only because of our feeling that a great source of energy was waiting to be tapped, the national impulse of a people held in temporary check by a misguided interpretation of historic method. The method referred to was the Zionist tendency hitherto to rely on great foreign benefactors like the Rothschilds and neglect the development of self-sustaining colonial institutions on the land itself. To do this, it was necessary to visualize and then to implement a scheme for creating a network of realities, a language, a grid of colonies, a series of organizations, for converting Palestine from its present state of neglect into a Jewish state. This network would not so much attack the existing realities as ignore them, grow alongside them, and then finally blot them out, as a forest of large trees blots out a small patch of weeds. A main ideological necessity for such a program was acquiring legitimacy for it, giving it an archaeology and a teleology that completely surrounded and, in a sense, outdated the native culture that was still firmly planted in Palestine. One of the reasons Weizmann modified the conception of the Balfour Declaration from its favoring the establishment of a Jewish national home to favoring a re-establishment was precisely to enclose the territory with the oldest and furthest reaching of possible realities. The colonization of Palestine proceeded always as a fact of repetition, the Jews were not supplanting, destroying, breaking up a native society. That society was itself the oddity that had broken the pattern of a 60-year Jewish sovereignty over Palestine which had lapsed for two millennia. In Jewish hearts, however, Israel had always been there, an actuality difficult for the natives to perceive. Zionism therefore reclaimed, redeemed, repeated, replanted, realized Palestine, and Jewish hegemony over it. Israel was a return to a previous state of affairs, even if the new facts bore a far greater resemblance to the methods and successes of 19th-century European colonialism than to some mysterious first-century forebears. Here it is necessary to make something very clear. In each of the projects for re-establishing Jewish sovereignty over Palestine there were always two fundamental components. One was a careful determination to implement Jewish self-betterment. About this, of course, the world heard a great deal. Great steps were taken in providing Jews with a new sense of identity, in defending and giving them rights as citizens, in reviving a national home language, through the labors of Eliezer ben Yehuda, in giving the whole Jewish world a vital sense of growth and historical destiny. Thus there was an instrument, in Zionism, for them to turn to, an instrument which could absorb them into the new life. For Jews, Zionism was a school, and its pedagogical philosophy was always clear, dramatic, intelligent. Yet the other, dialectically opposite component in Zionism, existing at its interior where it was never seen, even though directly experienced by Palestinians, was an equally firm and intelligent boundary between benefits for Jews and none, later, punishment, for non-Jews in Palestine. The consequences of the bifurcation in the Zionist program for Palestine have been immense, especially for Arabs who have tried seriously to deal with Israel. 
So effective have Zionist ideas about Palestine been for Jews, in the sense of caring for Jews and ignoring non-Jews, that what these ideas expressed to Arabs was only a rejection of Arabs. Thus Israel itself has tended to appear as an entirely negative entity, something constructed for us for no other reason than either to keep Arabs out or to subjugate them. The internal solidity and cohesion of Israel, of Israelis as a people and as a society, have for the most part, therefore, eluded the understanding of Arabs generally. Thus to the walls constructed by Zionism have been added walls constructed by a dogmatic, almost theological brand of Arabism. Israel has seemed essentially to be a rhetorical tool provided by the West to harass the Arabs. What this perception entailed in the Arab states has been a policy of repression and a kind of thought control. For years it was forbidden ever to refer to Israel in print, this sort of censorship led quite naturally to the consolidation of police states, the absence of freedom of expression, and a whole set of human rights abuses, all supposedly justified in the name of fighting Zionist aggression, which meant that any form of oppression at home was acceptable because it served the sacred cause of national security. For Israel and Zionists everywhere, the results of Zionist apartheid have been equally disastrous. The Arabs were seen as synonymous with everything degraded, fearsome, irrational, and brutal. Institutions whose humanistic and social, even socialist, inspiration were manifest for Jews, the kibbutz, the law of return, various facilities for the acculturation of immigrants, were precisely, determinately inhuman for the Arabs. In his body and being, and in the putative emotions and psychology assigned to him, the Arab expressed whatever by definition stood outside, beyond Zionism. The denial of Israel by the Arabs was, I think, a far less sophisticated and complex thing than the denial, and later the minimization, of the Arabs by Israel. Zionism was not only a reproduction of 19th century European colonialism, for all the community of ideas it shared with that colonialism. Zionism aimed to create a society that could never be anything but native, with minimal ties to a metropolitan center, at the same time that it determined not to come to terms with the very natives it was replacing with new, but essentially European, natives. Such a substitution was to be absolutely economical, no slippage from Arab-Palestinian to Israeli societies would occur, and the Arabs would remain, if they did not flee, only as docile, subservient objects and everything that did stay to challenge Israel was viewed not as something there, but as a sign of something outside Israel and Zionism bent on its destruction, from the outside. Here Zionism literally took over the typology employed by European culture of a fearsome orient confronting the Occident, except that Zionism, as an avant-garde, redemptive Occidental movement, confronted the Orient in the Orient. To look at what fulfilled Zionism had to say about the Arabs generally, and Palestinians in particular, is to see something like the following, extracted from an article printed in Ma'ariv, October 7, 1955. Its author was a doctor, a Karl Bach, who was a distinguished citizen and not a crude demagogue. His argument is that Islam opposes Zionism, although he does find room in his argument for the Palestinians. These Arab Islamic countries do not suffer from poverty, or disease, or illiteracy, or exploitation, they only suffer from the worst of all plagues, Islam. Wherever Islamic psychology rules, there is the inevitable rule of despotism and criminal aggression. The danger lies in Islamic psychology, which cannot integrate itself into the world of efficiency and progress, that lives in a world of illusion, perturbed by attacks of inferiority complexes and megalomania, lost in dreams of the holy sword. The danger stems from the totalitarian conception of the world, the passion for murder deeply rooted in their blood, from the lack of logic, the easily inflamed brains, the boasting, and above all, the blasphemous disregard for all that is sacred to the civilized world, their reactions, to anything, have nothing to do with good sense. They are all emotional, unbalanced, instantaneous, senseless. It is always the lunatic that speaks from their throat. You can talk business with everyone, and even with the devil. But not with Allah, this is what every grain in this country shouts. There were many great cultures here, and invaders of all kinds. All of them, even the Crusaders, left signs of culture and blossoming. But on the path of Islam, even the trees have died. 
This dovetails perfectly with Weizmann's observations about neglect in Palestine, one assumes that had Weizmann been writing later he would have said similar things to Karl Bach. We pile sin upon crime when we distort the picture and reduce the discussion to a conflict of border between Israel and her neighbors. First of all, it is not the truth. The heart of the conflict is not the question of the borders, it is the question of Muslim psychology moreover, to present the problem as a conflict between two similar parts is to provide the Arabs with the weapon of a claim that is not theirs. If the discussion with them is truly a political one, then it can be seen from both sides. Then we appear as those who came to a country that was entirely Arab, and we conquered and implanted ourselves as an alien body among them, and we loaded them with refugees and constitute a military danger for them, etc., etc. One can justify this or that side, and such a presentation, sophisticated and political, of the problem is understandable for European minds, at our expense. The Arabs raise claims that make sense to the Western understanding of simple legal dispute. But in reality, who knows better than us that such is not the source of their hostile stand? All those political and social concepts are never theirs. Occupation by force of arms, in their own eyes, in the eyes of Islam, is not all associated with injustice. To the contrary, it constitutes a certificate and demonstration of authentic ownership. The sorrow for the refugees, for the expropriated brothers, has no room in their thinking. Allah expelled, Allah will care. Never has a Muslim politician been moved by such things, unless, indeed, the catastrophe endangered his personal status. If there were no refugees and no conquest, they would oppose us just the same. By discussing with them on the basis of Western concepts, we dress savages in a European robe of justice. Israeli studies of Arab attitudes, such as the canonical one by General Harkabi, take no notice of such analyses as this one, which is more magical and racist than anything one is likely to encounter by a Palestinian. But the dehumanization of the Arab, which began with the view that Palestinians were either not there or savages or both, saturates everything in Israeli society. It was not thought too unusual during the 1973 war for the army to issue a booklet, with a preface by General Yona Efrati of the Central Command, written by the Central Command's rabbi, Abraham Avidan, containing the following key passage, when our forces encounter civilians during the war or in the course of a pursuit or a raid, the encountered civilians may, and by halakhic standards even must be killed, whenever it cannot be ascertained that they are incapable of hitting us back. Under no circumstances should an Arab be trusted, even if he gives the impression of being civilized. Children's literature is made up of valiant Jews who always end up by killing low, treacherous Arabs, with names like Mastol, Crazy, Bandura, Tomato, or Bukra, Tomorrow. As a writer for Harad said, September 20, 1974, children's books deal with our topic, the Arab who murders Jews out of pleasure, and the pure Jewish boy who defeats the coward swine. Nor are such enthusiastic ideas limited to individual authors who produce books for mass consumption. As I shall show later, these ideas derive more or less logically from the state's institutions themselves, to whose other, benevolent side falls the task of regulating Jewish life humanistically. There are perfect illustrations of this duality in Weizmann, for whom such matters immediately found their way into policy, action, detailed results. He admires Samuel Pefsner as a man of great ability, energetic, practical, resourceful and, like his wife, highly educated. One can have no problem with this. Then immediately comes the following, without so much as a transition. For such people, going to Palestine was in effect going into a social wilderness, which is something to be remembered by those who, turning to Palestine today, find in it intellectual, cultural and social resources not inferior to those of the Western world. Zionism was all foregrounding, everything else was background, and it had to be subdued, suppressed, lowered in order that the foreground of cultural achievement could appear as civilizing pioneer work. Above all, the native Arab had to be seen as an irremediable opposite, something like a combination of savage and superhuman, at any rate a being with whom it is impossible, and useless, to come to terms. 
the Arab is a very subtle debater and controversialist, much more so than the average educated European, and until one has acquired the technique one is at a great disadvantage. In particular, the Arab has an immense talent for expressing views diametrically opposed to yours with such exquisite and roundabout politeness that you believe him to be in complete agreement with you, and ready to join hands with you at once. Conversation and negotiations with Arabs are not unlike chasing a mirage in the desert, full of promise and good to look at, but likely to lead to death by thirst. A direct question is dangerous, it provokes in the Arab a skillful withdrawal and a complete change of subject. The problem must be approached by winding lanes, and it takes an interminable time to reach the kernel of the subject. On another occasion, he recounts an experience which in effect was the germ of Tel Aviv, whose importance as a Jewish center derives in great measure from its having neutralized the adjacent and much older Arab town of Jaffa. In what Weizmann tells the reader, however, there is only the slightest allusion to the fact of Arab life already existing there on what was to be the adjacent future site of Tel Aviv. What matters is the production of a Jewish presence, whose value appears to be more or less self-evident. I was staying in Jaffa when Ruppin called on me, and took me out for a walk over the dunes to the north of the town. When we had got well out into the sands, I remember that it came over our ankles, he stopped, and said, very solemnly, here we shall create a Jewish city. I looked at him with some dismay. Why should people come to live out in this wilderness where nothing would grow? I began to ply him with technical questions, and he answered me carefully and exactly. Technically, he said, everything is possible. Though in the first year's communications with the new settlement would be difficult, the inhabitants would soon become self-supporting and self-sufficient. The Jews of Jaffa would move into the new, modern city, and the Jewish colonies of the neighborhood would have a concentrated market for their products. The gymnasium would stand at the center and would attract a great many students from other parts of Palestine and from Jews abroad, who would want their children to be educated in a Jewish high school in a Jewish city. Thus it was Ruppin who had the first vision of Tel Aviv, which was destined to outstrip, in size and in economic importance, the ancient town of Jaffa, and to become one of the metropolitan centers of the eastern Mediterranean. In time, of course, the preeminence of Tel Aviv was to be buttressed by the military capture of Jaffa. The visionary project later turned into the first step of a military conquest, the idea of a colony being later fleshed out in the actual appearance of a colony, of colonizers, and of the colonized. Weizmann and Ruppin, it is true, spoke and acted with the passionate idealism of pioneers, they also were speaking and acting with the authority of Westerners surveying fundamentally retarded non-Western territory and natives, planning the future for them. Weizmann himself did not just think that as a European he was better equipped to decide for the natives what their best interests were, example, that Jaffa ought to be outstripped by a modern Jewish city, he also believed he understood the Arab as he really was. In saying that the Arabs' immense talent was in fact for never telling the truth, he said what other Europeans had observed about non-European natives elsewhere, for whom, like the Zionists, the problem was controlling a large native majority with a comparative handful of intrepid pioneers, it may well be asked how it is that we are able to control, with absurdly inadequate forces, races so virile and capable, with such mental and physical endowments. The reply is, I think, that there are two flaws to be found, the mental and moral equipment of the average African. That I say that inherent lack of honesty is the first great flaw, comparatively rarely can one African depend upon another keeping his word, except in very rare instances it is a regrettable fact that this defect is enlarged rather than diminished by contact with European civilization. The second is lack of mental initiative, unless impelled from the outside the native seldom branches out from a recognized groove and this mental lethargy is characteristic of his mind. This is C. L. Temple's Native Races and Their Rulers, its author was an assistant to Frederick Lugard in governing Nigeria and, like Weizmann, he was less a proto-Nazi racist than a liberal Fabian in his outlook. For Temple as for Weizmann, the realities were that natives belonged to a stationary, stagnant culture. Incapable therefore of appreciating the land they lived on, they had to be prodded, perhaps even dislocated by the initiatives of an advanced European culture. 
Now certainly Weizmann had the additional rationalizations behind him of reconstituting a Jewish state, saving Jews from anti-Semitism, and so on. But so far as the natives were concerned, it could not have mattered initially whether the Europeans they faced in the colony were Englishmen or European Jews. Then too, as far as the Zionist in Palestine or the Britisher in Africa was concerned, he was realistic, he saw facts and dealt with them, he knew the value of truth. Notwithstanding the fact of long residence on a native territory, the non-European was always in retreat from truth. European vision meant the capacity for seeing not only what was there, but what could be there, hence the Weizmann rep in exchange about Jaffa and Tel Aviv. The specific temptation before the Zionist in Palestine was to believe, and plan for, the possibility that the Arab natives would not really be there, which was doubtless a proven eventuality, a, when the natives would not acknowledge Jewish sovereignty over Palestine and, b, when after 1948 they became legal outsiders on their land. But the success of Zionism did not derive exclusively from its bold outlining of a future state, or from its ability to see the natives for the negligible quantities they were or might become. Rather, I think, Zionism's effectiveness in making its way against Arab-Palestinian resistance lay in its being a policy of detail, not simply a general colonial vision. Thus Palestine was not only the promised land, a concept as elusive and as abstract as any that one could encounter. It was a specific territory with specific characteristics that was surveyed down to the last millimeter, settled on, planned for, built on, and so forth, in detail. From the beginning of the Zionist colonization this was something the Arabs had no answer to, no equally detailed counterproposal. They assumed, perhaps rightly, that since they lived on the land and legally owned it, it was therefore theirs. They did not understand that what they were encountering was a discipline of detail, indeed a very culture of discipline by detail, by which a hitherto imaginary realm could be constructed on Palestine, inch by inch and step by step, another acre, another goat, so Weizmann once said. The Palestinian Arabs always opposed a general policy on general principles, Zionism, they said, was foreign colonialism, which strictly speaking it was, as the early Zionists admitted, it was unfair to the natives, as some early Zionists, like Ahad Hayam, also admitted, and it was doomed to die of its various theoretical weaknesses. Even to this day the Palestinian political position generally clusters around these negatives, and still does not sufficiently try to meet the detail of Zionist enterprise. Today there are, for example, 77 illegal Zionist colonies on the West Bank and Israel has confiscated about 27% of the West Bank's arab land, yet the Palestinians seem virtually powerless physically to stop the growth or thickening of this new Israeli colonization. The Palestinians have not understood that Zionism has been much more than an unfair colonialist master against whom one could appeal to all sorts of higher courts, without any avail. They have not understood the Zionist challenge as a policy of detail, of institutions, of organization, by which people, to this day, enter territory illegally, build houses on it, settle there, and call the land their own, with the whole world condemning them. The force of that drive to settle, in a sense to produce, a Jewish land can be glimpsed in a document that Weizmann says seemed to have anticipated the shape of things to come as indeed it did. This was an outline of program for the Jewish resettlement of Palestine in accordance with the aspirations of the Zionist movement, it appeared in early 1917, and it is worth quoting from, the suzerain government, that is, any government, allied or otherwise, in command of the territory, shall sanction a formation of a Jewish company for the colonization of Palestine by Jews. The said company shall be under the direct protection of the suzerain government, that is, whatever went on in Palestine should be legitimized not by the natives but by some outside force. The objects of the company shall be a to support and foster the existing Jewish settlement in Palestine in every possible way, b to aid, support and encourage Jews from other countries who are desirous of and suitable for settling in Palestine by organizing immigration, by providing information, and by every other form of material and moral assistance. 
the powers of the company shall be such as will enable it to develop the country in every way, agricultural, cultural, commercial and industrial, and shall include full powers of land purchase and development, and especially facilities for the acquisition of the crown lands, building rights for roads, railway harbors, power to establish shipping companies for the transport of goods and passengers to and from Palestine, and for every other power found necessary for the opening of the country. Underlying this extraordinary passage is a vision of a matrix of organizations whose functioning duplicates that of an army. For it is an army that opens a country to settlement, that organizes settlements in foreign territory, that aids and develops in every possible way such matters as immigration, shipping, and supply, that above all turns mere citizens into suitable disciplined agents whose job it is to be on the land and to invest it with their structures, organization, and institutions. Just as an army assimilates ordinary citizens to its purposes, by dressing them in uniforms, by exercising them in tactics and maneuvers, by disciplining everyone to its purposes, so too did Zionism dress the Jewish colonists in the system of Jewish labor and Jewish land, whose uniform required that only Jews were acceptable. The power of the Zionist army did not reside in its leaders, nor in the arms it collected for its conquests and defense, but rather in the functioning of a whole system, a series of positions taken and held, as Weizmann says, in agriculture, culture, commerce, and industry. In short, Zionism's company was the translation of a theory and a vision into a set of instruments for holding and developing a Jewish colonial territory right in the middle of an indifferently surveyed and developed Arab territory. The fascinating history of the Zionist colonial apparatus, its company, cannot long detain us here, but at least some things about its workings need to be noted. The Second Zionist Congress meeting in Basel, Switzerland, August 1898, created the Jewish Colonial Trust Limited, a subsidiary of which was founded in Jaffa in 1903 and called the Anglo-Palestine Company. Thus began an agency whose role in the transformation of Palestine was extraordinarily crucial. Out of the Colonial Trust in 1901 came the Jewish National Fund, JNF, empowered to buy land and hold it in trust for the Jewish people. The wording of the original proposal was that the JNF would be a trust for the Jewish people, which can be used exclusively for the purchase of land in Palestine and Syria. The JNF was always under the control of the World Zionist Organization, and in 1905 the first land purchases were made. From its inception as a functioning body the JNF existed either to develop, buy, or lease land, only for Jews. As Walter Lane convincingly shows, in a major piece of research on the JNF, on which I have relied for the details I mention here, the Zionist goal was to acquire land in order to put settlers on it, thus in 1920, after the Palestinian Land Development Company had been founded as an agency of the JNF, a Palestine Foundation Fund was created to organize immigration and colonization. At the same time, emphasis was placed institutionally on acquiring and holding lands for the Jewish people. This designation made it certain that a Zionist state would be unlike any other in that it was not to be the state of its citizens, but rather the state of a whole people most of which was in diaspora. Aside from making the non-Jewish people of the state into second-class citizens, it made the Zionist organizations, and later the state, retain a large extraterritorial power in addition to the vital territorial possessions over which the state was to have sovereignty. Even the land acquired by the JNF was, as John Hope Simpson said in 1930, extraterritorialized. It ceases to be land from which the Arab can gain any advantage either now or at any time in the future. There was no corresponding Arab effort to institutionalize Arab landholding in Palestine, no thought that it might be necessary to create an organization for holding lands in perpetuity for the Arab people, above all, no informational, money-raising, lobbying work done, as the Zionists did in Europe and the United States to expand Jewish territory and, paradoxically, give it a Jewish presence and an international, almost metaphysical status as well. The Arabs mistakenly thought that owning the land and being on it were enough. Even with all this sophisticated and far-sighted effort, the JNF acquired only 936,000 dinams of land in the almost half-century of its existence before Israel appeared as a state. The total land area of Mandate Palestine was 26,323,000 dinams. 
Together with the small amount of land held by private Jewish owners, Zionist landholding in Palestine at the end of 1947 was 1,734,000 dunams, that is, 6.59% of the total area. After 1940, when the Mandatory Authority restricted Jewish land ownership to specific zones inside Palestine, there continued to be illegal buying and selling within the 65% of the total area restricted to Arabs. Thus when the partition plan was announced in 1947 it included land held illegally by Jews, which was incorporated as a fait accompli inside the borders of the Jewish state. And after Israel announced its statehood, an impressive series of laws legally assimilated huge tracts of Arab land, whose proprietors had become refugees, and were pronounced absentee landlords in order to expropriate their lands and prevent their return under any circumstances, to the JNF. The process of land alienation, from the Arab standpoint, had been completed. The ideological, profoundly political meaning of the company's territorial achievements illuminates the post-1967 controversy over the fate of Arab land occupied by Israel. A large segment of the Israeli population seems to believe that Arab land can be converted into Jewish land A, because the land had once been Jewish two millennia ago, a part of Eretz Israel, and B, because there exists in the JNF a method for legally metamorphosing neglected land into the property of the Jewish people. Once Jewish settlements are built and peopled, and once they are hooked into the state network, they become properly extraterritorial, emphatically Jewish, and non-Arab. To this new land is added as well a strategic rationale that it is necessary for Israeli security. But were these things simply a matter of internal Israeli concern, and were they sophistic arguments intended only to appeal to an Israeli constituency, they might be analyzed dispassionately as being no more than curious. The fact is, however, that they impinge, as they always have, on the Arab residents of the territories, and then they have a distinct cutting edge to them. Both in theory and in practice their effectiveness lies in how they Judaize territory coterminously with de-Arabaizing it. There is privileged evidence of this fact, I think, in what Joseph Weitz had to say. From 1932 on, Weitz was the director of the Jewish National Land Fund, in 1965 his diaries and papers, My Diary, and Letters to the Children, were published in Israel. On December 19, 1940, he wrote, After the Second World War the question of the land of Israel and the question of the Jews would be raised beyond the framework of development amongst ourselves. It must be clear that there is no room for both peoples in this country. No development will bring us closer to our aim, to be an independent people in this small country. If the Arabs leave the country, it will be broad and wide open for us. And if the Arabs stay, the country will remain narrow and miserable. When the war is over and the English have won, and when the judges sit on the throne of law, our people must bring their petitions and their claim before them, and the only solution is Eretz Israel, or at least Western Eretz Israel, without Arabs. There is no room for compromise on this point. The Zionist enterprise so far, in terms of preparing the ground and paving the way for the creation of the Hebrew state in the land of Israel, has been fine and good in its own time and could do with land buying, but this will not bring about the state of Israel, that must come all at once, in the manner of a salvation, this is the secret of the messianic idea. And there is no way besides transferring the Arabs from here to the neighboring countries, to transfer them all, except maybe for. Bethlehem, Nazareth, and Old Jerusalem, we must not leave a single village, not a single tribe. And the transfer must be directed to Iraq, to Syria, and even to Transjordan. For that purpose we'll find money, and a lot of money. And only with such a transfer will the country be able to absorb millions of our brothers, and the Jewish question shall be solved, once and for all. There is no other way out. These are not only prophetic remarks about what was going to happen, they are also policy statements, in which White spoke with the voice of the Zionist consensus. There were literally hundreds of such statements made by Zionists, beginning with Herzl, and when salvation came it was with those ideas in mind that the conquest of Palestine, and the eviction of its Arabs, was carried out. A great deal has been written about the turmoil in Palestine from the end of World War II until the end of 1948. 
Despite the complexities of what may or may not have taken place, White's thoughts furnish a beam of light shining through those events, pointing to a Jewish state with most of the original Arab inhabitants turned into refugees. It is true that such major events as the birth of a new state, which came about as the result of an almost unimaginably complex, many-sided struggle and a full-scale war, cannot be easily reduced to simple formulation. I have no wish to do this, but neither do I wish to evade the outcome of struggle, or the determining elements that went into the struggle, or even the policies produced in Israel ever since. The fact that matters for the Palestinian, and for the Zionist, is that a territory once full of Arabs emerged from a war, a, essentially emptied of its original residence, and, b, made impossible for Palestinians to return to. Both the ideological and organizational preparations for the Zionist effort to win Palestine, as well as the military strategy adopted, envisioned taking over territory and filling it with new inhabitants. Thus the Dalit plan, as it has been described by the Zionist historians John and David Kimchi, was to capture strategic heights dominating the most likely lines of advance of the invading Arab armies, and to fill in the vacuum left by the departing British forces in such a way as to create a contiguous Jewish-held area extending from the north to the south. In places like Galilee, the coastal area from Jaffa to Acre, parts of Jerusalem, the towns of Lydda and Ramla, to say nothing of the Arab parts of Haifa, the Zionists were not only taking over British positions, they were also filling in space lived in by Arab residents who were, in White's word, being transferred. Against the frequently mentioned propositions that Palestinians left because they were ordered to by their leaders, that the invading Arab armies were an unwarranted response to Israel's declaration of independence in May 1948, I must say categorically that no one has produced any evidence of such orders sufficient to produce so vast and final an exodus. In other words, if we wish to understand why 780,000 Palestinians left in 1948, we must shift our sights to take in more than the immediate events of 1948, rather, we must see the exodus as being produced by a relative lack of Palestinian political, organizational response to Zionist effectiveness and, along with that, a psychological mood of failure and terror. Certainly atrocities, such as the Der Yassin massacre of 250 Arab civilians by Munich and Begin and his Ergen terrorists in April 1948, had their effect. But for all its horror, even Der Yassin was one of many such massacres which began in the immediate post-World War I period and which produced conscious Zionist equivalents of American Indian killers. What probably counted more has been the machinery for keeping the unarmed civilian Palestinians away, once they had moved, in most cases, to avoid the brutalities of war. Before as well as after they left there were specific Zionist instrumentalities for, in effect, obliterating their presence. I have already cited Whites in 1940. Here he is on May 18, 1948, narrating a conversation with Moshe Shertok, later Sherat, of the Foreign Ministry, transfer, post factum, should we do something so as to transform the exodus of the Arabs from the country into a fact, so that they return no more? His, sure talks, answer, he blesses any initiative in this matter. His opinion is also that we must act in such a way as to transform the exodus of the Arabs into an established fact. Later that year, Whites visited an evacuated Arab village. He reflected as follows, I went to visit the village of Muayar. Three tractors are completing its destruction. I was surprised, nothing in me moved at the sight of the destruction. No regret and no hate, as though this was the way the world goes. So we want to feel good in this world, and not in some world to come. We simply want to live, and the inhabitants of those mud houses did not want us to exist here. They not only aspired to dominate us, they also wanted to exterminate us. And what is interesting, this is the opinion of all our boys, from one end to the other. He describes something that took place everywhere in Palestine but he seems totally unable to take in the fact that the human lives, very modest and humble ones, it is true, actually lived in that wretched village meant something to the people whose lives they were. Whites does not attempt to deny the villagers' reality, he simply admits that their destruction means only that we can now live there. 
he is completely untroubled by the thought that to the native Palestinians he, whites, is only a foreigner come to displace them, or that it is no more than natural to oppose such a prospect. Instead, whites and the boys take the position that the Palestinians wanted to exterminate them, and this therefore licenses the destruction of houses and villages. After several decades of treating the Arabs as if they were not there at all, Zionism came fully into its own by actively destroying as many Arab traces as it could. From a non-entity in theory to a non-entity in legal fact, the Palestinian Arab lived through the terrible modulation from one sorry condition to the other, fully able to witness, but not effectively to communicate, his or her own civil extinction in Palestine. First he was an inconsequential native, then he became an absent one. Then inside Israel after 1948 he acquired the juridical status of a less real person than any individual person belonging to the Jewish people, whether that person was present in Israel or not. The ones who left the country in terror became refugees, an abstraction faithfully taking account of an annual United Nations resolutions calling upon Israel, as Israel had promised, to take them back, or compensate them for their losses. The list of human indignities and, by any impartial standard, the record of a moral subjugation practiced by Israel against the Palestinian Arab remnant is bloodcurdling, particularly if counterpoint with that record one hears the chorus of praise to Israeli democracy. As if to pay that wretched 120,000, now about 650,000, for its temerity in staying where it did not belong, Israel took over the emergency defense regulations used by the British to handle Jews and Arabs during the mandate period from 1922 to 1948. The regulations had been a justifiably favorite target of Zionist political agitation, but after 1948 they were used, unchanged, by Israel against the Arabs. For example, in those parts of Israel that still retain an Arab majority, an anachronistic but no less effective and detailed policy of Judaization goes on apace. Thus just as Ruppin and Weizmann in the early days foresaw Tel Aviv to outstrip Arab Jaffa, the Israeli government of today creates a new Jewish Nazareth to outstrip the old Arab town. Here is the project described by an Israeli in 1975, Upper Nazareth, which was created some 15 years ago, in order to create a counterweight to the Arab Nazareth, constitutes a cornerstone of the Judaization of the Galilee policy. Upper Nazareth was erected upon the hills surrounding Nazareth as a security belt surrounding it almost on all sides. It was built upon thousands of acres of lands which were expropriated high-handedly, purely and simply by force, from the Arab settlements, particularly Nazareth and Rana. The very choice of the name Upper Nazareth, while the stresses upon Upper, is an indicator of the attitude of the authorities, which give the new town special privileges according to their policy of discrimination and lack of attention regarding the city of Nazareth, which is, in their eyes, at the very bottom of the ladder. The visitor to Nazareth can acknowledge with his own eyes the neglect and lack of development of the city, and if from there he goes up to Upper Nazareth, he will see over there the new buildings, the wide streets, the public lights, the steps, the many-storied buildings, the industrial and artisan enterprises, and he will be able to perceive the contrast, development up there and lack of care down there, constant government building up there, and no construction whatever down there. Since 1966 the Israeli Ministry of Housing has not built a single unit of habitation in Old Nazareth. Yosef El Ghazi in Zohideri, July 30, 1975 The drama of a ruling minority is vividly enacted in Nazareth. With all its advantages, Upper, that is, Jewish, Nazareth contains 16,000 residents, below it, the Arab city has a population of 45,000. Clearly the Jewish city benefits from the network of resources for Jews. Non-Jews are surgically excluded. The rift between them and the Jews is intended by Zionism to signify a state of absolute difference between the two groups, not merely one of degree. If every Jew in Israel represents the whole Jewish people, which is a population made up not only of the Jews in Israel, but also of generations of Jews who existed in the past, of whom the present Israelis are the remnant, and those who exist in the future, as well as those who live elsewhere, the non-Jew in Israel represents a permanent banishment from his as well as all other past, present, and future benefits in Palestine.
The non-Jew lives a meager existence in villages without libraries, youth centers, theaters, cultural centers, most Arab villages, according to the Arab mayor of Nazareth, who speaks with the unique authority of a non-Jew in Israel, lack electricity, telephone communications, health centers. None has any sewage systems, except Nazareth itself, which is only partly serviced by one, none has paved roads or streets. For whereas the Jew is entitled to the maximum, the non-Jew is given a bare minimum. Out of a total workforce of 80,000 Arab workers, 60,000 work in Jewish enterprises. These workers regard their town and villages as nothing but places of residence. Their only prosperous industry is the creation and supply of manpower. Manpower without political significance, without a territorial base, without cultural continuity, for the non-Jew in Israel, if he dared to remain after the Jewish state appeared in 1948, there was only the meager subsistence of being there, almost powerless except to reproduce himself and his misery more or less endlessly. Until 1966, the Arab citizens of Israel were ruled by a military government exclusively in existence to control, bend, manipulate, terrorize, tamper with every facet of Arab life from birth virtually to death. After 1966, the situation is scarcely better, as an unstoppable series of popular riots and demonstrations testify, the emergency defense regulations were used to expropriate thousands of acres of Arab lands either by declaring Arab property to be in a security zone or by ruling lands to be absentee property, even if, in many cases, the absentees were present. A legal fiction of Kafkaesque subtlety. Any Palestinian can tell you the meaning of the Absentees Property Law of 1950, the Land Acquisition Law of 1953, the Law for the Requisitioning of Property in Time of Emergency, 1949, the Prescription Law of 1958. Moreover, Arabs were and are forbidden to travel freely, or to lease land from Jews, or ever to speak, agitate, be educated freely. There were instances when curfews were suddenly imposed on villages and then, when it was manifestly impossible for the working people to know of the curfew, the guilty peasants were summarily shot. The most wantonly brutal episode took place at Kafr Kassim in October 1956, during which 49 unarmed peasants were shot by the Frontier Guard, a particularly efficient section of the Israeli army. After a certain amount of scandal the officer in charge of the operation was brought to trial, found guilty, and then punished with a fine of one piaster, less than one cent. Since occupying the West Bank and Gaza in 1967, Israel has acquired approximately a million more Arab subjects. Its record has been no better, but this has not been surprising. Indeed, the best introduction to what has been taking place in the occupied territories is the testimony of Israeli Arabs who suffered through Israeli legal brutality before 1967. See, for instance, Sabri Jirius the Arabs in Israel or Fuzi al Asmars to be an Arab in Israel or Elia T. Zrakes the Palestinians in Israel, a study in internal colonialism. Israel's political goal has been to keep the Arabs pacified, never capable of preventing their continued domination by Israel. Whenever a nationalist leader gains a little stature, he is either deported, imprisoned without trial, or he disappears. Arab houses, approximately 17,000, are blown up by the army to make examples of nationalist offenders. Censorship on everything written by or about Arabs prevails. Every Arab is directly subject to military regulations. In order to disguise repression and to keep it from disturbing the tranquility of Israeli consciousness, a core of Arab experts, Israeli Jews who understand the Arab mentality, has grown up. One of them, Amnon Lin, wrote in 1968 that the people trusted us and gave us a freedom of action that has not been enjoyed by any other group in the country, in any field. Consequently, over time we have attained a unique position in the state as experts, and no one dares to challenge our opinions or our actions. We are represented in every department of government, in the histadrit and in the political parties, every department and office has its Arabists who alone act for their minister among the Arabs. This quasi-government interprets and rules the Arabs behind a facade of privileged expertise. When, as I noted in Chapter 1, visiting liberals wish to find out about the Arabs, they are given a suitably cosmetic picture. 
Meanwhile, of course, Israeli settlements on occupied territories multiply, over 90 of them since 1967, the logic of colonization after 1967 follows the same pattern, resulting in the same displacements of Arabs as before 1948. There are Zionism and Israel for Jews, and Zionism and Israel for non-Jews. Zionism has drawn a sharp line between Jew and non-Jew, Israel built a whole system for keeping them apart, including the much-admired, but completely apartheid, kibbutzim, to which no Arab has ever belonged. In effect, the Arabs are ruled by a separate government premised on the impossibility of isonomic rule for both Jews and non-Jews. Out of this radical notion it became natural for the Arab Gulag archipelago to develop its own life, to create its own precision, its own detail. Yuri Avnery put it this way to the Knesset, a complete government, was created in the Arab sector, a secret government, unsanctioned by law, whose members and methods are not known to anyone. Its agents are scattered among the ministries of government, from the Israel Lands Administration to the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Religions. It makes fateful decisions affecting Arab lives in unknown places without documents and communicates them in secret conversations or over the telephone. This is the way decisions are made about who goes to the teacher's seminar, or who will obtain a tractor, or who will be appointed to a government post, or who will receive financial subsidies, or who will be elected to the Knesset, or who will be elected to the local council, if there is one, and so on for a thousand and one reasons. But from time to time there have been inadvertent insights into government for Arabs in Israel given to watchful observers. The most unguarded example was a secret report by Israel Koenig, Northern District, Galilee, Commissioner of the Ministry, written for the then Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin on handling the Arabs in Israel. The full text was subsequently leaked to Al Hamishmar on September 7, 1976. Its contents make chilling reading, but they fulfill the assumptions of Zionism toward its victims, the non-Jews. Koenig frankly admits that Arabs present a demographic problem since unlike Jews, whose natural increase is 1.5% annually, the Arabs increase at a yearly rate of 5.9% moreover, he assumes that it is national policy for the Arabs to be kept inferior, although they may be naturally susceptible to nationalist restlessness. The main thing, however, is how to make sure that in areas like Galilee the density of the Arab population, and consequently its potential for trouble, be reduced, contained, weakened. Therefore, he suggested that it is necessary to expand and deepen Jewish settlement in areas where the contiguity of the Arab population is prominent, and where they number considerably more than the Jewish population. Examine the possibility of diluting existing Arab population concentrations. Special attention must be paid to border areas in the country's northwest and to the Nazareth region. The approach and exigency of performance have to deviate from the routine that has been adopted so far. Concurrently, the state law has to be enforced so as to limit breaking of new ground by Arab settlements in various areas of the country. The quasi-military strategy of these suggestions is very near the surface. What we must also remark is Koenig's unquestioning view of the Zionist imperatives he is trying to implement. Nothing in his report intimates any qualms about the plainly racial end his suggestions promote, nor does he doubt that what he says is thoroughly consistent with the history of Zionist policy toward those non-Jews who have had the bad luck to be on Jewish territory, albeit in disquietingly large numbers. He goes on to argue, logically, that any Arab leaders who appear to cause trouble should be replaced, that the government should set about to create, the word has an almost theological tone very much in keeping with Jewish policy toward Arabs, new Arab figures of high intellectual standard, figures who are equitable and charismatic, and completely acceptable to the Israeli rulers. Moreover, in dissipating the restless nationalist leaders, whose main sin seems to be that they encourage other natives to chafe at their enforced inferiority, the government should form a special team to examine the personal habits of leaders and other negative people and this information should be made available to the electorate. Not content then with diluting and manipulating the Arab citizens of Israel, Koenig goes on to suggest ways for economically neutralizing and encumbering them. Very little of this can be effective, however, unless there were some method of somehow checkmating the large population of frustrated intelligentsia forced by a mental need to seek relief. 
Expressions of this are directed against the Israeli establishment of the state. Koenig appeared to think it natural enough for Arabs to be kept frustrated, for in reading his suggestions there is little to remind one that Arabs are people, or that his report was written not about Jews by a Nazi during World War II, but in 1976 by a Jew about his Arab co-citizens. The masterstroke of Koenig's plan comes when he discusses the social engineering required to use the Arabs' backward Levantine character against itself. Since Arabs in Israel are a disadvantaged community, this reality must be enhanced as follows. A. The reception criteria for Arab university students should be the same as for Jewish students and this must also apply to the granting of scholarships. A meticulous implementation of these rules will produce a natural selection, the Darwinian terminology speaks eloquently for itself, and will considerably reduce the number of Arab students. Accordingly, the number of low-standard graduates will also decrease, a fact that will facilitate their absorption in work after studies. The plan here is to make certain that young Arabs would easily be assimilated into menial jobs, thus ensuring their intellectual emasculation. B. Encourage the channeling of students into technical professions, the physical and natural sciences. These studies leave less time for dabbling in nationalism and the dropout rate is higher. Koenig's ideas about the incompatibility between science and human values go C. P. Snow one better. Surely this is a sinister instance of the use of science as political punishment, it is new even to the history of colonialism. C. Make trips abroad for studies easier, while making the return and employment more difficult, this policy is apt to encourage their emigration. D. Adopt tough measures at all levels against various agitators among college and university students. E. Prepare absorption possibilities in advance for the better part of the graduates, according to their qualifications. This policy can be implemented thanks to the time available, a number of years, in which the authorities may plan their steps. Were such ideas to have been formulated by Stalinists or Orwellian socialists or even Arab nationalists, the liberal outcry would be deafening. Koenig's suggestions, however, seem universally justified by the logic of events pitting a small, valiant Western population of Jews against a vast and amorphous, metastasizing and ruinously mindless Arab population. Nothing in Koenig's report conflicts with the basic dichotomy in Zionism, that is, benevolence toward Jews and an essential but paternalistic hostility toward Arabs. Moreover, Koenig himself writes from the standpoint of an ideologist or theorist as well as from a position of authority and power within Israeli society. As a ruler of Arabs in Israel, Koenig expresses both an official attention to the well-being of Jews, whose interests he maintains and protects, and a paternalistic, managerial dominance over inferior natives. His position is therefore consecrated by the institutions of the Jewish state, licensed by them, he thinks in terms of a maximum future for Jews and a minimal one for non-Jews. All of these notions are perfectly delivered in the following paragraph from his report, Law enforcement in a country with a developing society like that of Israel is a problem to be solved with flexibility, care and much wisdom. At the same time, however, the administrative and executive authority in the Arab sector must be aware of the existence of the law and its enforcement so as to avoid erosion. Between Weizmann and Koenig there exists an intervening period of several decades. What was visionary projection for the former became for the latter a context of actual law. From Weizmann's epoch to Koenig's, Zionism for the native Arabs in Palestine had been converted from an advancing encroachment upon their lives to a settled reality, a nation-state, enclosing them within it. For Jews after 1948, Israel not only realized their political and spiritual hopes, it continued to be a beacon of opportunity guiding those of them still living in diaspora and keeping those who lived in former Palestine on the frontier of Jewish development and self-realization. For the Arab Palestinians, Israel meant one essentially hostile fact and several unpleasant corollaries. After 1948 every Palestinian disappeared nationally and legally. Some Palestinians reappeared juridically as non-Jews in Israel, those who left become refugees and later some of those acquired new Arab, European, or American identities. No Palestinian, however, lost his old Palestinian identity. 
Out of such legal fictions as the non-existent Palestinian in Israel and elsewhere, however, the Palestinian has finally emerged, and with a considerable amount of international attention prepared at last to take critical notice of Zionist theory and praxis. The outcry in the West after the 1975 Zionism is Racism resolution was passed in the United Nations was doubtless a genuine one. Israel's Jewish achievements, or rather its achievements on behalf of European Jews, less so for the Sephardic, Oriental, Jewish majority, stand before the Western world, by most standards they are considerable achievements, and it is right that they not sloppily be tarnished with the sweeping rhetorical denunciation associated with racism. For the Palestinian Arab who has lived through and who has now studied the procedures of Zionism toward him and his land, the predicament is complicated, but not finally unclear. He knows that the law of return allowing a Jew immediate entry into Israel just as exactly prevents him from returning to his home. He also knows that Israeli raids killed thousands of civilians, all on the acceptable pretext of fighting terrorism, but in reality because Palestinians as a race have become synonymous with unregenerate, essentially unmotivated terrorism, he understands without perhaps being able to master the intellectual process by which his violated humanity has been transmuted, unheard and unseen, into praise for the ideology that has all but destroyed him. Racism is too vague a term, Zionism is Zionism. For the Arab-Palestinian, this tautology has a sense that is perfectly congruent with, but exactly the opposite of, what it says to Jews. Burdened with a military budget draining off 35% of its gross national product, isolated except for its few and increasingly critical Atlantic friends, beset with social, political, and ideological issues it can deal with only by retreating from them entirely, Israel today faces a grim future. President Sadat's mission of peace has at last occasioned the semblance of opposition to Begin's fossilized theological madness, but it is doubtful whether in the absence of a conceptual, much less institutional, apparatus for coming humanely to terms with the Palestinian actualitites, any decisive change will come from that quarter. The powerfully influential American Jewish community still imposes its money and its reductive view of things on the Israeli will. Then, Two, one must not overlook the even more redoubtable U.S. defense establishment, more than a match for the business sector's hunger over oil-bloated Arab markets, as it continues to heap advanced weapons on an Israel and now an Egypt primed daily to combat radicalism, the Soviet Union, or any other of the United States' geopolitical bugbears. The net effect in unrestrained Israeli militarism is accurately indicated by a Haaretz article, March 24, 1978, celebrating the Lebanese adventure in the following terms, what has happened last week, has shown to everyone who has eyes in his head, that the Israeli Defense Force is today an American army both in the quantity and quality of its equipment, the rifles, the troop carriers the F-15s, and even the KFIR planes with their American motors, are a testimony that will convince everybody. But even this peon to what its author calls Israel's overflowing military equipment is equaled in pernicious influence by Western and Israeli intellectuals who have continued to celebrate Israel and Zionism unblinkingly for 30 years. They have perfectly played the role of Gramsci's experts in legitimation, dishonest and irrational despite their protestations on behalf of wisdom and humanity. Check the disgraceful record and you will find only a small handful, among them Noam Chomsky, Israel Shahak, I. F. Stone, Elmer Berger, Judah Magnus, who have tried to see what Zionism did to the Palestinians not just once in 1948, but over the years. It is one of the most frightening cultural episodes of the century, this almost total silence about Zionism's doctrines for entreatment of the native Palestinians. Any self-respecting intellectual is willing today to say something about human rights abuses in Argentina, Chile, or South Africa, yet when irrefutable evidence of Israeli preventive detention, torture, population transfer, and deportation of Palestinian Arabs is presented, literally nothing is said. The merest assurances that democracy is being respected in Israel are enough to impress a Daniel Moynihan or a Saul Bellow, for instance, that all is well on the moral front. But perhaps the true extent of the state worship can only be appreciated when one reads of a meeting held in 1962 between Martin Buber and Avram Aderet, published in the December 1974 issue of Pedahim, an Israeli religious quarterly. 
Ade Red is extolling the army as a character-building experience for young men and uses as an instance an episode during the 1956 war with Egypt when an officer ordered a group of soldiers simply to kill any Egyptian prisoners of war who were in our hands. A number of volunteers then step forward and the prisoners are duly shot, although one of the volunteers avers that he closed his eyes when he shot. At this point Aderet says, there is no doubt that this test can bring a confusion to every man of conscience and of experience of life, and even more so to young boys who stand at the beginning of their lives. The bad thing which happened is not the confusions in which those young men were during the time of the deed, but in the internal undermining which took place in them afterwards. To this edifying interpretation, Buber, moral philosopher, humane thinker, former binationalist, can say only, this is a great and true story, you should write it down. Not one word about the story's horror, or of the situation making it possible. But just as no Jew in the last hundred years has been untouched by Zionism, so too no Palestinian has been unmarked by it. Yet it must not be forgotten that the Palestinian was not simply a function of Zionism. His life, culture, and politics have their own dynamic and ultimately their own authenticity to which we must now turn.